Okay, so I had to redo the. I had to redo this. I did not plug in my microphone to this cable that's plugged into my to my audio recorder. So we're gonna restart everything, and I'm, gonna, I'm redoing the whole episode. I've already tasted the wine. I like the wine. This is very unusual for me to do this, but let's go. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so at the end of last year, I reviewed six different Cabernet Sauvignons from Chile. To start off this year, I'm going to review six different Sauvignon Blancs from Chile. I'm sorry, eight different Sauvignon Blancs from Chile. I have a typo in the script. This is this is a free sample provided to me and I have no restrictions on how I review it. Okay, if you want to get a more detailed explanation of Chilean wine, then check out my first episode of the Cab Series last year, episode 99 about the Miguel Torres Corriera de las Cabernet Sauvignon. The link for that will be below in the description. This is the fourth wine in this series. It comes from the Matetic Vineyards, Matetic Vineyards in the Casablanca Valley. They have a relatively short history, though the family has been in Chile for a long time. Jorge Matetic uh, Saltina, it's probably pronounced a little bit differently, uh, but I'll get to that in a second, came to Punta, Punta Arenas in Chile in 1892. He immigrated from the ancient port, uh, ancient port of Fiume that was once part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It is now known as uh, Rijeka in modern day Croatia. Hence why I am stumbling over all the pronunciations and why I think how I pronounce it might be closer to how they pronounce it, but Croatian probably pronounced differently. Google Translate, you were no help on that. And basically that's all the website tells us. All right, now let's fast forward to 1999 when the vineyards were first planted in the Rosario Valley. This valley straddles the Casablanca Valley and the San Antonio Valley Dios. The vineyard is in the San Antonio Valley Dio and is just called the El Rosario Vineyard. In 2003, the winery is built at this spot. It is a gravity, gravity flow winery. This means that there are no pumps to move the wine around. The main thing about this is that it leads to less oxidation of the wine, moving, moving, from it, moving it from one type of vessel to another. It also, in theory, could save on energy and even maintenance costs if they had equipment, but everybody really talks about the oxidation thing and also being gentle on the wine, which, again, is probably just a euphemism for, oxi for oxidation. Anyway, they build a hotel called La Cosona in 2004. The hotel is adjacent to the well, La Cosona Vineyard. It's in 2004 they received their organic certification and began working on being biodynamic. In 2013, they received their Demeter certification for biodynamics for all of their vineyards. They have four in all. Now, just to break my arm a bit, pat myself on the back, but I was able to find all four vineyards. The website gave me just enough info along with a great picture of each to find them. The only one I don't know the exact boundaries is funny enough, their estate vineyard, El Rosario. The thing is, there's just enough ambiguity here from looking at the pictures from the website and looking at Google Earth as to which parts are their vineyards and which parts are not. I did a best guess to create one that is close to the 67 hectares they say is the size of the vineyard. Google Earth can tell you like how big an area is and how long a line is and all that. That's how I figure that stuff out. I'll just say that I was able to find all the vineyards for all the wines in this series. There were a couple from this set that were pretty difficult to find, but I did find them, at least based on the information I have. All right, so let's go back to the wine. While they talk about being certified bio, this particular wine only states the wine is made with organic grapes. In the US, this is the base level certification for organic. In Chile, it's listed as organic. Now, in order to be biodynamic, you have to start with organic grapes. So I'm not sure why the wine isn't at a higher organic standard for the US or why it's not bio. The website also talks about being certified sustainable, though I don't see any of those certifications on this bottle. So maybe this particular bottling doesn't meet that. The grapes do come from a vineyard they own. 
Or maybe it does meet all the requirements, but for some reason they did, they decided not to label it that way or get the certs in order to label it bio and sustainable. The tech sheet for this wine and just about every other one I looked up uh, from them mentions the vineyards for those being managed organically and biodynamically. And then using the biodynamic calendar in the winery to make the wine. Plus they all said there were certified, they were certified organic for the EU and Chile. Now they have four lines of wines, the uh, Coralillo, EQ, EQ Limited, and the Metatic. The Coralillo is, from what I can tell, the kind of the highest production, though this one is not a low production wine by any means. Um, that one and this one are probably around the same price point. And then as you go up to the next two, the looks like the production goes down and the, the prices probably are going up. For this wine, the grapes are coming from their Valle Hermoso vineyard. It's fairly close to the, to the Pacific, about eight miles away. So there's a definite influence here from the ocean. It's made from what seems to be the two main clones everyone uses, 242 and 1. So the tech sheet states the following about the vineyard. Hermoso's soils are of granite origin in an advanced state of decomposition with a presence of mica rich in orange, rich in iron, not orange, uh, and a texture without aggregation at a depth where the roots can grow unencumbered. Thanks to biodynamic management of the vineyard, the grapes reach a natural balance. Additionally, for this vintage, we selected soils according to their distinct characteristics of granite composition, depth and conductivity among other factors. My feeling is when they talk about the soils, they're talking about plots of the, of the vineyard that they chose that, you know, different parts of the vineyard have different types of soils. It's probably what they're talking about. Yield for the vineyard that year was right about three tons per acre, uh, listed as seven and a half tons per hectare. They did a lot of the typical winemaking stuff like destemming, cool maceration for 12 hours, then being pressed. They mentioned it was in an oxygen-less environment, remember this for later, using an inert gas most likely argon. They did this to preserve the grape's aromatic potential. Fermentation was temperature controlled and at a cool temperature in stainless steel tanks. The wine rested on, on the lees in those tanks for four months. Also remember this for later. In addition to that, about 30% was fermented in 700 liter concrete M4 or French oak barrels of varying sizes from 228 to 400 liters. They explained this was to enhance the mineral notes, texture and mouthfeel of the wine. Let's get the rest of the stats for the wine. The 2020 Metetic Vineyards EQ Coastal Sauvignon Blanc, suggested retail price $20, from the Valle de Casablanca DO, 100% Sauvignon Blanc, uh, using clone 242 with 65% of that, and 35% using clone 1, made with organic grapes, soil, granitic, aging, four months over fine lees, total production, 9,670 cases, that's just over 116,000 bottles. The ABV is 13.5%, the pH is 3.04, the pHs are, are getting lower and lower as we go along here in this series. The total acidity is 6.23 grams per liter, the RS or residual sugar is 1.25 grams per liter. Let's get into the wine. All right, so first off, when I first smelled it, it wasn't super aromatic. So the remember for later is they were doing this in an oxygenless environment. Now, let's be clear. They use oak barrels. That's not during a lot of the processing of the wine. They're making the wine. They, they were using inert gas to prevent oxidation. And they get into a barrel. The barrels will allow oxygen in there, but they still could put like the inert gas, like argon, like we use for the Coravin, um, on top of, you know, for the headspace in the barrel. Um, and then the concrete tanks, concrete tanks by the very nature, concrete allows a little bit of oxidation in there because there's usually oxygen inside the little, like uh, little bumps and valleys and whatever of the, of the concrete, unless they like have some type of epoxy or whatever smooth thing. But you still could like sparge all the tanks with an inert gas to try to, try to get all the oxygen out. The reason I say that is because it wasn't very aromatic and that could have been why I wasn't getting the aromatics. And then as I was smelling it, it felt like the aromatics was going a little bit better. Now that's been another 10 minutes or so since I've tried the wine, let's see how it is. So the aromatics are about the same on, on the nose as far as level of aromatics. Now, um, when, I, when I did it originally, I was getting uh, some chalkiness to it. 
Um, I was getting some uh, minerality to it, which the Lee's aging is probably responsible for that. And I was getting more orange, orange blossom, uh, a little bit of bell pepper, green pepper. I, I get a little bit of this now. I get more of that minerality than anything else. Okay, so let's taste it. It's acting kind of like it did 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago. It was all in the palate. So you get that orange quality. You get a little bit of that greenness to it. It's more not really bell pepper jalapeno. It's more of like a vegetal type of thing going on. It tastes really good. There's a richness to it. That's the Lee's aging. Some mouthfeel going on here. I didn't really notice it last time, um, but I do notice it now. It's very citrusy. Um, the orange is the predominant citrus for me. There's a touch of lemon, lime, and grapefruit going on here. That grapefruit presence would probably lead me into, it's probably Sauvignon Blanc. The Lee's aging is not super common for Sauvignon Blancs. This is one of a few of the wines that do have Lee's aging to it. It gives it a broadness of palate. It kind of helps with the acidity, though it's still pretty acidic and tart. Um, it's really delicious. It didn't change much when I first put, put my lips to this. Um, just as I said all that, I'm getting that jalapeno bell pepper. So it's retronasally is starting to come through. I think it's the wine that just needs to open up. Now, one of the things I was talking about with this wine, I got a little bit of salinity to it. Um, I mentioned hot dogs, and that's about where I was like, oh no, I don't have, I'm not plugged in. So as a kid, I go to Florida, visit my grandparents. This reminds me of the beach. Like I could bring this to a beach, and I was talking about how you could either put, there's these containers, you can put the whole bottle in, like the bottle itself, and then you could do that, bring it to the beach or the pool, or just get a container, just pour all the wine in there. And this would be a great, I think, pool wine or beach wine, porch pounder. I'm talking about hot dogs. And I remember, I don't get the pool toy anymore, but I got the pool toy a little bit. I had like a Riesling reference. Uh, and that's where I got to the hot dogs. So back as a kid, I totally could have hot dogs with this, right? They would, they would put the hot dogs like in the boiling, you know, using water boil the water, put the hot dogs in there, get them cooked. And then we would go to the beach and they would put the hot dogs in the thermos. I don't know what you all did, what you guys did, but that's what we did. And that just takes me back as a child to that, to that experience. And I, it's weird how memories just pop up out of nowhere. Um, and that's probably where the pool toy came in. I remember, I, I can remember in my head smelling and feeling the, the raft, you know, the plastic raft that we would bring probably bought one every time, a new one every time, or my, one of my grandparents always had one. So I can remember doing that with my parents and my grandparents and doing this. So this wine gives me that great memory. Uh, and that's what wine can really do. Um, none of the other wines really sparked anything like that, which is nothing wrong with the other wines I had today. Uh, but this one just really sparked that memory. Um, I think this is a wine that could really develop over time if it was exposed a little more, more air. But also, I mean, I think it's, I think it's really well made. The other thing to mention is that these wines are, most of these wines now are around room temperature, so it's perfect for analyzing. So if this was colder, it would be a little more subdued. I think it tastes great at this temperature, honestly. There's a little guava to this. That's what it is. There was something I couldn't identify. There's a little guava to it. That's, and that tastes really good. All right. That's just gonna do it for today's show. If you enjoyed what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell all your friends. And we'll see you next time with my empty glass again.